Please give him a warm welcome. Thank, <coughs> thank, thank you very much, Barbara. And, and I want to thank Scott as well. And I want to thank the friends for uh, inviting me here to speak this evening. And I have to say, Scott, I, 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 you know, you talked about the sharks here, and I have to tell share a quick story. I, a couple years ago, I was actually speaking up in Vancouver. And coincidentally, the night I was speaking up in Vancouver, the Sharks happened to be playing the Vancouver Canucks that night. And they made some rather <laughs> off-the-cuff marks about go Sharks. And that barely got me out of Vancouver in one piece that night. <laughs> um, and actually, the Sharks won, actually. So it was a, and it was a playoff game even more so. So um, sometimes, you know, being an explorer, you have to try new challenges. And that was kind of a challenge for me. It was, I've been to Vancouver, but it was a whole new adventure and journey trying to uh, talk about my San Jose Sharks and the Canucks and being in Vancouver. So those are the type of exciting things, adventures and stuff, although that was a different type of shark I was looking at there. So um, one of the things I like to, when I start talking, I like to talk, to kind of pose out to people is how many people out there have always like wanted to be an explorer out there? Anybody? A lot of people? Yeah, I know that. It's, it's always kind of, it's, it's sort of in your heart to want to be an explorer. And how many people like you, you always, you know, you strive, you want to like rise to the top of your profession as well. Is that something every, we all want to strive for? That's right, yeah. So we can't, we, we I try to talk about that because they kind of intertwine as far as like being an explorer, which I'm really, that's what I am, I kind of explorer, adventure at heart. But it's also like enabled me to, to go on a journey I have through life that's it's just opened many doors to me that I never imagined when I started out, and it's allowed me to move up in my particular profession. So one of the things that I want to get started right now tonight is show you a quick video of a program I did with Shark Week. Do we have a mic? Do you hear that? Oh, sorry. It's okay. So I'm sorry you couldn't hear it as well, but that excitement there is like what I live for. It's just, it's, it's, it's an incredible experience. And like when I have a group like Shark Week and Discovery Channel contacts me and they're like, hey, let's go see if we can get a, uh, what, you, what do you want to do? Can you go see if we can get a Mega Mouth Shark? I can do that for you guys. 
And so, uh, which they're kind of like going, yeah, I don't really know if this guy can or not, but, you know, I knew I could. They were a little less uncertain. They weren't as certain about it. And I'll tell you a little more about that story of this here in a few minutes. So, so my, my mission really is, is it always has been, is they're looking for these lost sharks. Before I get into the lost sharks, I want to talk about a shark that most everyone here is probably familiar with if you live in the Monterey area. And this is a great white shark. This was a species that was uh, of, of, of Jaws fame. That was the book that came out in the, in the early 70s and the movie by the same name that came out in, in 1975. And any of you have been in the area here, I went and saw this movie when I was in high school over at the old Steinpeck Theater in Cannery Row. Some of you might remember that. And uh, anyway, it, had a, it was kind of a cool movie to go see. And uh, anyway, but it, it's, it's a kind of speed, it's the thing that most people, when you watch a program on, where it's on Shark Week or some other National Geographic thing, they always like to f feature these, the white shark. And what's interesting is that, you know, you probably, if you watch a show now, you'll see these big sharks blasting up out of the water, usually in South Africa, breaching and everything. And when I was in South Africa in the late 80s, I would go, come back home here, I'd go to my professors and some of my friends and go like, man, you can't believe it, these big white sharks just come jumping out of the water. And they're like, okay, like, how much did you have to drink before you were like telling us this story here? And I was like, no, no, really, guys, these things are really like, are really jump out of the water like that. But of course, you didn't have any photographs. And uh, of course, I didn't think to actually, actually photograph them at the time. And it was only a couple years after I had left uh, South Africa, a fellow named Chris Fallows was able to capture this event on TV. And suddenly he became world famous and, and rich and famous and everything. And I was like, well, I was kind of like, I told you guys about it, but I didn't think to get any <laughs> photographs of it. So, um, so anyway, but it's kind, of it kind of a neat little story in that thing. And um, even though white sharks are really neat, they're, they're kind of iconic when it comes to sharks because most people recognize them. And I might add here, I've been going, uh, uh, been up, you know, I grew up here in the Monterey area and I've been, in the last few years, been going up in, uh, in the helicopters with uh, uh, some, some friends over that run the specialized helicopters in Watsonville. And, and to give you a sense of how the health of the bay here is, you know, I'll go up there and fly in, you know, within a two, three mile stretch up around the cement boat in Capitola, I'll see 30 white sharks just off the beach swimming around there. And, uh, and of course, you know, I'm thinking like, yeah, when I was a kid, I used to go spearfishing out here all the time. And I'm sure there are a few sharks around, but, uh, but you know, I, I had no idea and maybe there weren't as many at that time. But, I would, but you know, it just speaks really well to the health of the bay that you see so many of these large apical predators out here. And of course, you're flying along, you're seeing these sharks down here and you're seeing like these kids playing in the surf there and the parents are sitting on the beach and they have no idea there's sharks down there. And you know, we had one time, we were talking to a guy in a, a kayak down there and said, hey, can you see any sharks? He goes, no, I don't see anything. And we're like, yeah, well, there's like six right around you in the kayak. But when you're down at the water level, you can't see them. So uh, anyway, but I kind of I want to mention that because these, again, these are some of the iconic species that most people think about. Much as the way you think about this thing here, the tiger shark. Again, it's one of these sort of large, toothy species that people recognize, and especially if you're in the tropics. You know, we don't really get these species up here, but you know, in Hawaii, once in a while, unfortunately, they do bite people, and it get, makes a bit of the news. But those, and, and I think there's that thing about these large sharks that have teeth on them, uh, the large teeth, and they occasionally bite people. Here's another species, the oceanic white tip. Interesting story with this, associated with this one is back in the, um, Back when I was in South Africa, I was on a, we were doing a survey, me and, me and a, a group of colleagues and stuff, we were all studied sharks, and we're up off the uh, South African Mozambique border, and we're offshore, it's, you know, it's in the tropics, and it's really warm out there. And actually warm, it's actually hot and humid. And so we, we're fishing, dropping these deep long lines, three, 4,000 feet deep, and of course you let them stay there for a couple hours, and then you pull them up to see what you're catching. Well, of course, you're out there, and you're waiting for the line to soak in the water, and so we thought, well, let's go for a splash out the back. So we just dive around, goof around, and you know, we're wearing face masks, and the water visibility was amazingly clear. It's you know, easily saying I could see 100 feet was just was was would probably be an underestimate of what we could see. So we did. We're out there for an hour, an hour and a half, and finally, okay, it's time to go back to work. So we climb out, of, climb back onto the boat, and we're not in the boat five minutes. And these things start swimming by the boat. And you can see there's a, there's a, this isn't the same situation, but you see the boat here. And these sharks are attracted to the boat because they associate it with food. And we're sitting here looking at this going like, well, that could have like wiped out the entire brain trust of the shark research <laughs> unit in South Africa. 
because those sharks didn't just show up. They were around there the whole, probably the whole time we were in the water. They were just kind of keeping their distance and say we're diving with face masks and we're looking around and we just never saw a single shark. Um, so because of that, I kind of avoid jumping in the, in, the op you know, in the open ocean like that. And so to answer a question somebody might ask at the end of the program, why was your graduate student in the water with the mega mouse shark? <laughs> yeah, that's why. <laughs> so, um, so why you have some of these species of sharks that are very iconic. Um, people don't often realize that sharks come in a variety of sizes and shapes. You have things here like the, uh, the whale shark, which gets about 60 feet in length. By comparison, your school bus gets only about 45 feet long. And some people do recognize these whale sharks because there are some ecotourism trips that people can go on. They're large, they've got a checkerboard pattern. But how many people realize these things occasionally show up in Monterey Bay? Anybody? Okay, a couple of you, okay, yeah. This was something I, didn't, I only figured out about 10, 15 years ago. I was talking to some local people. Say, oh yeah, we see these things off Santa Cruz, Monterey, Big Sur. Okay, well, that's kind of cool. I didn't know that. Um, but this is, actually, this, is, it is one of, this is actually the largest fish in the world. Contrast that to the spined pygmy shark, which is one of the smallest sharks in the world. In fact, you know, it only gets about as big as this pointer here, about as big as your hand. And in fact, most sharks actually are less than about five, six feet in length. In fact, 80 over 80 percent of all sharks only get to about five feet in length. The ones that get big though, like the white shark and the tiger shark that I show, those things get, they'll get 15, 20 feet or more. They get quite large. And the mega mouth actually does, it, even though it has small teeth, it's a filter feeder, they actually get quite, they actually are, get quite large. They'll get over to 20, 22, 23 feet. And then you have things like the cookie cutter shark here, which has kind of sectoral lips around it. And it's actually a parasite, a parasitic shark species. And it lives, um, and it, it feeds on, or it basically takes cookie cutter bites out of larger uh, prey species like whales, dolphins, uh, other sharks, um, uh, big fish. And it also has occasionally uh, taken bites out of swimmers, open ocean swimmers. And of course, I'm thinking like, okay, we have oceanic white tips and cookie, I didn't even think about cookie cutter sharks when I was diving out in the open ocean. Um, but there are actually a few people do these ocean swims like between islands in Hawaii that, are, that recently there was someone who was bit, bitten on the chest and on the calf by one of these things. And I put that shark up there because it, get, it only gets about two and a half feet long, but this species has the largest teeth in proportion to its body of any shark species, including the white shark. And uh, so here you got the shark that gets, you know, sort of about this big, but relative to the size of its body, it has these huge teeth, but it has to have that in order to like feed the way it does. Now people often think about sharks as coming in, you know, sort of gray or brown. Nobody really ever thinks that sharks are pink with blue fins. <laughs> like here's a goblin shark. And I'm telling you, this shark, it actually is, it's pink with blue fins when they're alive. And this was actually, this specimen here was actually a part of another Shark Week show we did last year where after we did the mega mouth thing, they called up and they were like, Okay, great. What can we do now for an encore? I said, well, why don't we go to like Japan and we can tag, see if we can tag goblin sharks. And they're like, okay, that sounds kind of cool. And, but they, again, you're like, that. well, we'll see, we got a mega mouth, let's see if we can do a goblin shark. Well, we managed to get some goblin sharks and tag them, which is pretty cool because both these were the first time they'd ever been done. Another species <coughs> that has, again, it's a little different, it's called a six gill shark. Now, does anybody know how many gills most sharks have? Five, absolutely, that's correct. Most sharks have five. None have less than five, but there's a couple of species that have, there's about five or six species that have six gills, and there's two species that have seven gills. And if you go over to the Monterey Bay Aquarium, one of the, what's called the broad-nosed seven gill shark is one of the species over there. The six gill and the seven gill actually have a lot of sort of sentimental value to me because when I started my graduate studies at Moss Landing Marine Laboratories in the early 80s, I was kind of looking around like, God, I really want to study sharks. I want to work in a species, but I had no idea where to start. So I took a ride up to the California Academy of Sciences, and I went up and I introduced myself to Dr. John McCosker, who was the director of the uh, Steinhardt Aquarium at the time. And I said, you know, I'm looking around. I'm trying to find some kind of a, a, some sharks to work on. I have no idea what, what to do. And he says, well, you know, Dave, there's, and keep in mind, I just went up there and introduced myself to, this, to him. He says, you know, there's these sharks out here in San Francisco Bay and along the coast 
it's called a seven gill shark. They're really common out here, and there's also they get some of these six gill sharks, and we know nothing about them. We know they're out there, we get them all the time, but nobody knows anything about them. And I was like, great, I'm gonna go work on these six and seven gill sharks. So I came back down to Moss Landing, and I, and I went to my, my advisor's office there, and some of you may know Greg Kaye, he's, uh, he's a local in the community here, he lives, he's a retired, he's a professor emeritus. I went in the office and said, Greg, I'm gonna work on six and seven gill sharks. And he looks at me and he goes, oh, you're gonna work on Notorhynchus and Hexanchus? And I was like, what's that? And he says, get out of my office, don't come in my office and waste my time or your time if you don't even know the scientific name of the species you're gonna work on. And of course, so after kind of being a little bit deflated, it was like, well, I look back on it now, I was like, that was actually great advice because why should I waste his time and mine? I didn't even bother. I was just happy I had something to go work on. And so I went back and I learned, I learned the species. I read everything I could on them and I came back a week or two later and we had a great meeting and kind of everything, and my career sort of took off from there working on this particular species. And it was awesome because these, this literally that going up and talking to Dr. McCosker up at the academy and, and some of the advice I got from Greg really is what took me, it took me from, more, from starting here at Moss Landing and it's basically taken me on this wonderful journey I've been on. Now, sharks also have some interesting names that come up with, which is kind of fun, that's sort of my thing these days. Um, and I didn't have a name to all these, but these are just some different sharks. And this is actually what's called a shy shark. And if you notice here, it's kind of a nice colorful little species, has a variegated color pattern. And this is a group of sharks that is endemic it's only known from South Africa. And they're called shy sharks because if you, if you disturb them at all, they'll curl up and they'll put their tail over their eyes. And so, because they're shy. This, this is a cat shark, yeah. And, and this particular cat shark, is, the scientific name is Hapoblephus edwardsii. But we, call, we like to call them happy eddies for short, which they are kind of a happy little shark, except if you disturb them, then they get shy and they curl up, and, put their, and they're an unhappy eddy when they put their, t their tail over their eyes. But you have some other sharks that kind of have fun names like Pinocchio cat sharks, which have a long nose. And the reason they have a long nose, it has like a lot of sensories. They live down in the deep sea in the dark and they have all these sensory organs they have on their, uh, on their, on their, raw, on their nose. Basically it helps them navigate, find food and find mates in the deep sea where it's dark out. You have another species people like to hear the name of. It's called a uh, lollipop cat shark. It's literally this deep sea shark that's shaped like a lollipop it has enlarged gill area, which gives it its body shape, and it lives mostly down in Baja and the Gulf of California in these deep sea basins that have low oxygen. So they're actually able to survive where most fish and sharks can't survive because of, its, of, its, of this, the, 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 uh, the gill openings it have. You have other things called like uh, woobigongs in Australia, and woobigong is actually a, an Australian aboriginal name for sort of tassel mouth. But one of the other ones I enjoy seen are these ghost sharks, which are kind of cool. And I'm always kind of, they're, they're, and they're not actually sort of like a, what you think of as a true shark, but these ghost sharks, they're also called chimeras or ratfish, they are what unites them and the rays, which the rays are really a flat shark. If you flatten a shark, that's more or less a ray. And the sharks, they, these all have cartilaginous skeletons. And that contrasts to all the other sharks you see, or the other fish you got here, like rockfish and salmon and halibut, those are all bony fishes, and the vast majority of fishes are bony fishes. You just have this group of sharks, including the ghost sharks, that have, these, that have a cartilaginous skeleton. And the thing I'm kind of always kind of proud about, and I always like to mention in my lab over here, is of the, there's about 50 or so species of these ghost sharks. And my labs, actually, we've, you know, over the past decade and a half, we've named 20% of all these known species. So I'm always kind of proud about, about, about that, and I like to brag, to brag about my students and everything when I can. So with all these different species out there, it's, 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 as uh, Barbara mentioned in the introduction, it's, it's just been an amazing journey to have a chance to actually follow my passion and work on what I do. And it's taken me to, to countries all over the world. And I've been to places, you know, people think of like, well, I'll go to Paris or I'll go to London or Rome or someplace. You know, I go to places like Walin, Taiwan. Does anybody know where Walin is? Some of you may have been there. It's off the southeast coast of Taiwan. Why do you go there? Well, I knew I could go there and go out with some fishermen and find mega mouth sharks. Or I go to places like Mauritius in the, in the southern Indian Ocean. In 10 days time, I'm off to Sri Lanka to go looking for some lost sharks there. We're gonna go up in the north part of the country there 
into the Tamil area, which has been in a civil war for 25 years, which ended in 2009. No one's even really surveyed up in there. So I'm kind of looking for this. And there's a really cool adventure coming up. And after that, I'll be going to South Africa and then Brazil over the next few months. And all of this has been very fortunate just from, from just a passion I developed as a kid. I'll tell you more about that in a moment. But people, particularly like young people, start now always bring up these questions about like, well, gosh, Dave, you know, is there anything out there really left to dis discover and to name? And I says, yes, there is. People don't realize, you might hear this figure once in a while, they always, and it really is true, that there's only about 10% of all species that have actually been named, and that's everything. That's plants, animals, viruses, bacteria. It's, it's only about, been about 10% of everything's ever been named. Does anybody know about how many new species of everything is named a year? Yeah. Um, it depends on uh, mammals, reptiles. Everything. And everything, I'd say 100, and then you have to divide it into different classes. It's, there's 18,000 species named a year on average. <laughs> and people don't realize that, that there's this amazing diversity out there because it is, a lot of the science goes on and people don't fully realize this. When I talk about sharks, if you look here on the, on the, on the, on the, in this pie chart here, between 1758 and 1899, there was about 420 species described. Over the first 80 years of the 20th century, we described another 429 species. In the last 38 years, we've described 414 or so species. And so we've done more in the last 38 years than we have in the prior two time periods I mentioned. So I tell people, yeah, there's a lot out here to be discovered. In fact, I've discovered new ghost sharks right out here in Monterey Bay. And I'll bet for hardly anyone, anyone even knows that. that there's so, as fun as it is, I like to get my passport and go somewhere exotic. There's things right here in the bay you can describe and find here if you know where to look. So how do you go about describing a species, Dave? I get that question quite a bit. <laughs> well, it's like, kind of like a crime scene investigation. And only we're the, shark, we're the shark scene investigation. And I like to use this one of all the different CIS shows because it's got Ted Danson and back in the 80s, Ted had dark hair. I used to have dark hair. Ted's <laughs> hair is gray. My hair is gray. I'm happy I still have hair. I think Ted has a toupee now. But we've had this sort of link over the last sort of 30 years. I always like to use this particular uh, image to show. But when you, collect, when you get a species of shark or, you know, a ray or ghost shark out there, there's a whole series of measurements you have to take in order to like really be able to determine is this a new species. And so when you get something, you, you catching it, you collecting it's part of it, but you need to bring it back to the laboratory and take a whole series of measurements on it. And you can take up to sometimes up to 100 measurements on this and look at different proportional ratios. And then you have to compare it to other species, or sim I say other species, similar looking species to determine if it's different. And there's a whole code, it's called the International Commission on Zoological Nomenclature, a whole protocol you have to go, go through. And sometimes it could take years to actually be able to name a new species out there. And that's just one. So that's why you get a sense of like how it can be, it can be kind of slow sometimes. So why do you do this? I do this because people don't think like, what happens if these disappear, these particular iconic species? And you can throw the white shark in there. People would be upset about that. They, they, they would recognize, like, wow, we don't have any lions or elephants, gorillas, polar bears, white sharks. You know, at one time, sea otters were very low. They are on the rebound and done very well now, or the California condor closer to home. But people, rec pe you know, there's whole conservation groups have been set up just to keep, to, to pay attention to these things. Well, you know, I'm not worried, honestly, about, like, white sharks because they're one of the most protected species in the world. This is what I look for. Here's this honeycomb cat shark. This is a species that we have not seen since 1972. It didn't even have a name for it until 2006, 34 years after we last saw it. Now we know this was a common species off Mozambique and South Africa in the 50s and 60s. We have records of it. We know this thing was around. It didn't have a name yet, but we knew what it was. But we haven't seen this thing in, in decades, and it wasn't even named. But, th but this is the thing that I, it gets me going. This is what I want to go find out. Where are these things here? Here's another species, the speckled cat shark. We haven't seen this thing since 1991. It was discovered and named in 1972. We haven't seen this thing in decades now. And yet people, 
you know, outside a few people in the world, really, no one's, you know, no one's really even paying any attention to these things. And if I had to pick a poster shark for these, for these particular lost sharks, it'd be this one. This is a Pondicherry shark. It was, it was discovered and named off from Pondicherry, India in, in 1839. And actually, when I'm going to Sri Lanka, where I happen to be going, it's just kind of a stone's throw across the channel there from, uh, from Pondicherry, India. We haven't seen this shark for five decades. So like, okay, so like there's all these sharks out here you can't find or we haven't seen. What's, why do we care? Well, from my perspective, these are really the proverbial canaries in the coal mine. And most of you know what that is. You know, the miners used to put down a canary into the coal mine. And if it came up alive, it meant it was safe to go in there. If it was not alive, it meant there was toxic gases down and they couldn't go down there. Well, with these, these sharks, are really the ones to, to pay attention to because when you start losing things like white sharks or tiger sharks, these higher level things, it's probably almost too late at that point because these lower level ones have probably already disappeared. So you have this sort of bottom-up system going on. But again, everybody's focused on the white sharks and why they're doing that. I'm looking for the ones that are really should be of a concern to people. Things like this pond and Terry shark. I could spend an hour up here going through one species after another that we haven't named yet or hasn't, or hasn't even been, we haven't seen for decades. But while there's species we haven't found in decades that we haven't seen, we have things like this little lantern shark here, which, is a new, which we think is a new species that we discovered last year in Tokyo Bay in Japan. Now you might, you know, maybe some of you know or don't know, but that's one of the most highly trafficked areas in the, in the world. It's like San Francisco Bay or Long, Port of Long Beach or even out here in Monterey, and we're still finding new species here that nobody's really looking for. And it was kind of funny when, when I was doing the program there, is they were out looking for goblin sharks, and my Japanese colleague and I are finding things like this that we didn't even have, know would have names. We found another shark up there. It's called a, 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 a salamander cat shark. There's been less than 10 of these ever seen in the world, and we actually got one on this trip up here. So we're kind of excited about that, and the film crew is kind of like going like, what are you guys looking at these for? Aren't we looking for goblin sharks? Yeah, well, okay, those are kind of passe. This is what we really want to look for. <laughs> Because it was really cool to find these things. So, there's, so you, you're, is, the point is we're still finding things out there, but how many of these things have like disappeared that we'll never know what they were because they may be gone already? So at, in addition to like going and looking for these things, it's like the question obviously I get is like, well, where do you find these lost sharks? Well, all kinds of places really. You can find them dancing on stage with Katy Perry. <laughs> And if you, if, you're, if you haven't counted yet, the sharks do have five gills, so the person that was doing this didn't know what, didn't know what they were doing at the time. <laughs> um, sometimes they show up in the post office box, literally in the mail. I've had shark, I had had new species literally show up in the mail I wasn't expecting. I opened them up with my grad student, and we're like, oh, that looks like a new species. It turned out to be a new species. But the best place I find to, to find new species of sharks is at fish markets. And like this is a, fish market in Taiwan I've been going to for about 30 years now. I go every once in a while and I have an opportunity. And as cool as it is to go out on a boat, you know, you're usually one, maybe two people out on a boat, on one boat, trying to catch stuff. And you, you, might, you, you, you might get some things. But what's cool going to the fish markets is I have 100 boats coming in every day bringing in sharks. So I just wander around the fish markets and watch what they're, watch what they're bringing in. And so even though they're fishing just for their substance or just to feed the village or, the, or, the, or make some money, to me it's like they're all out here catching sharks for me. I can see, I can see what's going on. I also spend a lot of time, I'll, I'll go up and I'll talk with fishermen up there. And a lot of times you run it, there's language barriers. But you know, you work your way around it. You just, you kind of, when just being part of an explorer, you got to be resourceful sometimes and you figure out a way to do it. So one village I was in, in, in Taiwan, I was, trying to muddle through and speak some Mandarin to them, you know, ni hao and she she and stuff. And my uh, uh, Taiwanese colleague was kind of, and the fisherman I was talking to was kind of smiling because he goes, and I go, did I, did I mangle the words really badly? He goes, he goes, no, you're trying to talk Mandarin and these guys speak Taiwanese, which is a local dialect. And it's like, oh, okay, so I'll just let you talk now and I'll just stand back and just, <laughs> Um, but they actually found it humorous and actually ever since then, literally it's going on 30 years now, I go back to them. They still remember me and, kind of wave when I show up there and I have some other colleagues there kind of interpret for me. So it's kind of cool to know that. So, so people often 
I get a, another question, you know, like a lot of students and stuff will ask me, younger people will ask me, like, well, how did you do this? How do you come out of it? How did you figure out how to do, go out and do all this stuff? Was this some grand plan or something? And I said, well, not exactly, but when I was about five years old, my kids gave me a book on sharks. And, you know, most kids, you kind of go through that shark and dinosaur and whale phase, you know, and I'm like, I was just mesmerized by these sharks. I thought this was the coolest thing around. You know, my parents were like, yeah, don't worry, he'll grow out of this thing. <laughs> well, at about age 10, I still hadn't grown out of it yet, and I was like, you know, I'm going to go out and I'm going to travel the world, I'm going to study sharks, and I'm going to figure out a way to get paid to do it. And I was 10 years old. I had no idea how I was going to get from here to here, but by golly, I was going to do that. And so, you know, I just, it was just like, I just had this thing, this goal I wanted to work towards. Now, as I mentioned, I'm a local guy. I grew up in Prunedale. I went to Castroville. When I grew up, it, you know, thinking you're going to, you know, get out of Prunedale and go travel around the world <laughs> is just not something that was on everybody's lexicon. You know, it's like, you're going to go where? You're going to do what? And, uh, you know, so I, but I, I said I went, I went to Castro. I was there before there was even a high school in, in, in out in North County. We had to go to Salinas at the time. And I, went, and I graduated, finished eighth grade there. I went on to Palma High School in Salinas. I went from there to Hartnell for a couple of years, and then eventually on to, on to Humboldt State. And I just had this driving thing. Again, I had no idea how I was going to get where I was going, but I just had this, this one focus that I wanted to go travel around and study sharks. And when I was finishing up at Humboldt State, and I, I joke around with my students now because, you know, they always talk about, you know, being an AP student, and, you know, I was like, what's an AP student? Because I know what it meant when I was a student. And they said, well, you know, it's an advanced placement class. I'm like, oh, you know, and I, I was well, I was well versed in being an AP student, but when I was a student, it was an academic probation. <laughs> so, um, so it had, times have changed, obviously, over the last few years. And um, so, I had a professor at Humboldt told me, like, you know, well, you know, Dave, if you really, I was telling, I really want to go to travel around the world. And he says, well, you know, if you want to go anywhere, you really need to go to grad school. So at that time, coming out of the Jaws era in the, the kind of the mid late 70s and early 80s, I came down to Moss Landing. And at the time, Greg Kaye was my former advisor, or advisor for my master's. You know, I, I told you a little bit about him earlier. I went down there, I talked with him about, like I said, I really wanted to come here, and he was starting up. The Jaws thing really kind of was a good timing because it was when people got interested in sharks and there was some shark research really started up. And I said to Greg, I said, you know, I really, I'm a little worried about getting in here with my grades. And he was like, oh, listen, Dave, don't worry. You're, getting in is not going to be your problem. Getting out is going to be your problem, <laughs> which was true. But the thing was, I just had that focus, and I, I keep coming back that drive to keep going along. And, you know, and at the time, you know, I, I just, I was going through there and trying to figure out how I was going to do this. And while I was doing my master's, I met a guy, Leonard Capagno, who at the time was one of the foremost authorities in the world on sharks. And, he, and when he, I kind of, we got to be friends, and he was up at the Tiburon Center. And he actually worked in the original Jaws. He designed the mechanical shark Bruce, believe it or not. Um, he got a job in South Africa. And as he was leaving to go to South Africa, I made a joke like, hey, if you need anybody to carry your bags, let me know. Well, about eight months later, I get a phone call. Hi, Dave, this is Leonard. Yeah, hey, how's it going, man? Oh, pretty good. Hey, I got this PhD position here. Would you like it? And then I was off. And here my, my, my dream was coming true. I was going overseas. I was going to travel. And I just had that focus. I wasn't sure what the plan was going to be, but it was just meeting people and keeping the right focus and going. And this is me. This is a white shark, by the way. But I'm not smiling because there's a white shark there is on, this, on the slab that some fishermen have brought in. But I just turned in my PhD, which in my family was the first time anybody had ever gone on for any kind of an advanced degree uh, in college. So I was ha happy about that, you know. And I was also happy, like, hey, I just finished a PhD. I'm like, they're going to call me doctor now? You know, going from, you know, AP to being a doctor <laughs> is kind of a long stretch. Um, so I was pretty happy about that, and, and Shark wasn't so happy that day, but I was kind of happy about that. Um, but along the way, <clears throat> again, things you just sort of learn along the way as you go is that, you know, both my advisors, Greg and, and Leonard and stuff, said, you know, if you're going to really do anything in this field or go anywhere, you need to be able to write and publish, and you need to be able to speak. 
Now, I was a guy who was pretty introvert, introverted. You'd never guess that now because you can't get me to shut up most of the time now, but I was pretty quiet. Uh, guy and I couldn't you know, write to save my life and I can and trust me there's some of my English teachers at Castroville and at Palma and at Hartnell are rolling in their graves now. Uh, in fact I even be able to write a book let alone I've written 28 books now and I have over 500 publications describing sh sharks and so I learned again it was one of these things that somebody you know in my circle there of people that I met said you know you, this is what you've got to do if you want to advance in this field here. So I, so I just I learned I just literally forced myself to learn how to write and how to speak publicly because those are skills. I tell students that it's a skill you need to learn. And it's taken me on my whole journey now. It's been kind of cool. I talked earlier about some of the different species we've named. I've, you know, I've named over 40 species now and I have like another 40 in my lab that just, you know, we're working on. We're hopefully we'll get there someday. You know, it's just, it's again, it's a kind of field, it's mostly a field of passion. And these are just some different things of species in the upper right corner there is a unique uh, ghost shark to the Galapagos. The shark at the bottom is a white cheek shark. It's from Mozambique. And it's kind of cool naming some of these different things. But one in particular, the one in the upper your left corner there, is a saw shark. <coughs> now it was kind of cool about this one. This particular one's always had a bit of a nice sentimental thing. I only named this one a few years ago. Because I named this one Lana's Saw Shark. Now, who's Lana? Lana is my niece who graduated from the University of San Francisco. And I was so happy she was the first girl in our family and to ever graduate college. And so I kind of wanted to honor the moment by naming a shark after her. And I told her, I said, you know, your great grandkids can go to the California Academy of Sciences and this shark will always be there and will always have this name associated with you. Well, she thought that was pretty cool. And this was actually the picture here is very special to me because that was when she uh, showed her this new shark. Of course, now she's just now finishing her master's in nursing. Aha, she's doing nursing. And so, since old Uncle Dave's going to need somebody to look after him in his old age, this is my <laughs> insurance plan to look after me in, in my later decrepit years. So, so, there's actually a little bit of a two, two things going on here. So, but anyway, it's kind of cool to be able to do that. I mean, I, like I told her, I said, anybody can name a star after you, but not a shark, not a cool shark like this. So, I've, I've talked a little bit about my journeys to look for sharks a little bit of how I got to where I was going. And so I just want to impart a few things onto, onto you this evening here. And these are just things I've learned along in my journey in life and, and what I've picked up and things I just pass along. And some of these things will be things that you know, you've probably heard before, but these are things that I've attributed to my success. You know, one, you know, work hard, you know, and you work smart. It seems like a <coughs> cliche, but you know, this is me. I'm up five, six in the morning working away because you know, my feeling is if I'm sleeping, somebody else is working and I'm not going to let them beat me to it. And so, you know, like I get my sleep, you know, I exercise, I do all that, but you know, I'm not going to be lounging around because somebody might beat me to something. And a good example, I just mentioned this to my students here, was just literally the week before Christmas, just this past December. I had a, uh, I had a, I was contacted by uh, some colleagues at the United Nations, the Food and Agriculture Organization, which I do a lot of work for now. And I do consulting work. And they said, hey, we have this little project here. Can you um, help us out on it? And I said, yeah, sure, no problem. And so they had a few weeks like, to do it, but I just dove right in and I worked away in this thing. And, and on the December 24th, you know, New Year's Eve or Christmas Eve day, I got up in the morning, I finished off this thing, I sent this project off to them. And, Think like, okay, well, this is a government bureaucracy. Nobody, will, I won't hear back from them until after the first year. Well, that afternoon, I got an email back from him. Said, hey, Dave, this was great. Thanks a lot, man. And yeah, when you get a chance, like, could you do this other little thing for the project? And I was like, yeah, no problem. And I looked at it and I go, I can do this in a few minutes. It took me like 30 minutes, took care of it, sent it back to him. And these guys are halfway around the world. It's Christmas Day for them. And I thought I wouldn't hear back from them. They're not going to get back to me. Well, they wrote me back and within about 15 minutes. And they said, this was great. And oh, by the way, we have a bigger project coming up next month we'd like to like have you work on, meaning, ooh, that's going to be kind of lucrative. So I, by being on the ball and working on something, it wasn't a lot of time, but it was enough time that, and effort and energy I put into it that it, it led to a bigger thing. And that's what I tell people. There's always other opportunities. Second thing I, wanna, I, I like to impart on people is you have people from very diverse fields, 
again, regardless of your field, you know, whether you're Dr. Seuss or Michael Jordan or Walt Disney, you know, people have all have this have one thing kind of in common with all these people here. And the best thing I could find in terms of a quote is, if failure is not an option, then neither is success. You can't fear failure. You need to be able to go out there and just give it a shot. And you need to work at it. You're not going to show up the first day and make the basket or throw a touchdown or make a great business decision. You have to work at it. People ask me now, they say, well, how do you know if this is a new shark or not? I say, well, I can spend the next half hour and tell you about my 35 years and working towards this. But I can tell you I spent 35 years working this, so I know what this thing is. And that's a key thing that people, you know, I try to tell people is you need to be, you know, it's, it's all about working towards something and being aware of it. And, 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 and a part of this is if you ever talk to people, you always see these, they'll ask someone who's just done something successful, whether it's like Steve Jobs at Apple or someone, what was the key to your success? And most people start telling you about all their failures. Oh, you know, I did this wrong, I did that wrong, I did this. And you're going like, no, no, I want to know about your success. Well, they are telling you about their success. Their success lied in having failed but worked to improve upon that failure. Practice makes perfect. And that's the key thing that I tell people. And, you know, I, I, there was, I saw a quote a few years ago from a J.K. Rowling who did the Harry Potter series. And here was, here was someone who was a single mom. She was on government assistance and writing these books. And she said, you know, failure was liberating to her because it enabled her to write what she wanted to. And clearly the Harry Potter series was a very successful series for her. So that's, again, don't, you know, you know don't fear failure. And the third thing I pass along to people, and it's a fairly easy one, is be kind to people. Be friendly. It'll take you amazing places, and I've found that in my life. Just people I've met along the way, some I you know, never thought anything would come of it. The people in the upper left corner here of the, uh, of the screen, these are a couple of my Chinese colleagues in Taiwan. The guy in the middle is a fisherman. The guy in the, next to him is a guy who I, I were in grad students together, and I met, first met 30 years ago in 1988 when I first went to Taiwan on a fellowship. And we've stayed friends ever since. And you know, when a couple of years ago, when Discovery uh, Channel called looking for a Shark Week program, I said, hey, we can go tag mega mouth sharks. Guess who I contacted? My fisherman friend and my shark friend, who's now like the one of the foremost authorities on sharks in, in Taiwan. And boom, because I knew some people, we knew where to go, and we were able to go out and do stuff. And I also tell like students too, you know, because I remember when I was starting up, and I've shared a few of these stories tonight, Whereas as you're on the way up, you know, you always want to be, if you're good to people, that's kind of how people are going to treat you on, when and you're on the backside of your career, when you're looking at retirement or heading, you know, towards the sunset or whatever. And I tell, I tell students, you know, and I lose a lot of my own experiences where there were people when I started out were very kind to me and people that were very big names in the field and they didn't owe me anything, but they just took the time, took a few minutes to talk to me and listen to me, would write me letters and Many of us here know what it was like you used to have to write a letter. It wasn't like today where you just do Snapchat and boop, there we go. So you actually had to write stuff. And, and, and the fact that people would go to that extra effort back then meant a lot to me. So I tell them, you know, be kind to people as much as you can. And finally, <coughs> like to close here, you know, and, and just tell you, I hope they've given me a little bit of a sense of the, of sort of the journey I've been on, sort of, the, sort of some of the adventures and kind of the fun part of being an explorer. And, you know, I wanted to just kind of show you, this was a clip from the BBC that I had done um, a couple years ago for their shark series that came out. It was kind of an anniversary of Jaws' 40th year. And let me just run this here really quickly. It's just about a minute long. Is that all right? No, sorry. Dr. David Eaton, the dedicated administrator of the Galactic Empire, and the recipient of the Blue Shell Award. Now let's turn that off. It's an assignment that's taken him around the globe. Most of us were young children. 
apologize. The audio wasn't very good on that. But um, anyway, it was just it was it was an it was a great opportunity. And as I mentioned, I you know kind of my journey has taken me from you know Prunedale, California, to all over the world, working with groups like the BBC, National Geographic, Discovery Channel. I'm one of the primary shark experts that the UN calls on to work to, to work with them. I'm a guy who's gone from cow tipping in Prunedale to have had dinner with the Emperor of Japan at the Royal Palace. I was in South Africa when Nelson Mandela was out, and I was actually down at the Grand Parade. And the reason I t mention some of these things is you, you never know where life's going to take you. In my case, it was just having a focus, wanting to go out and travel and see the world and look for sharks. I never expected all of this other stuff that would come to come that would happen people I'd meet and places I would go and just amazing experiences. And I just want to close by saying I just wish all of you have a tremendous time on your journey. I wish you all the best as an explorer pursuing your own lost sharks, whatever that might be, whatever your passion might be. And I'll just finally say if you want to follow me, I'm going to be off to a few places, Sri Lanka in about 10 days, and then South Africa and Brazil. And you can follow me on social media. And uh, wish you all the best, and happy trails and happy travels.